Acts chapter 2. Let's begin reading in verse 42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for your word. Lord, there's so many other things we could be looking to this morning and putting our focus on, but we chose the better thing, just like Mary did verse in, in, in juxtaposition to her sister Mar Martha. We want to sit at your feet and learn from you. There is no other place to look to that has the words of eternal life than you, Jesus. And we want to be changed. We want to be transformed from glory to glory by your Holy Spirit as we learn your word. So we, we ask, Lord, that you would be our teacher this morning. We humble ourselves and we open up our hearts for you to speak to us regarding anything that we need to make adjustments with, anything that we need to repent of, anything that we need to add to our lives, anything at all that you're speaking to us, your servants are listening. And we ask that you would help us to be not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Lord, we don't, we're not interested in self-deception, thinking that it that we're good if we agree with the things that we hear. We want to ask ourselves, are we obeying the things that we hear, Lord? And we're so grateful for your Holy Spirit who speaks to us and helps us in that. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. I had planned on giving this two-part teaching that we're going to begin today uh, at the beginning of the year. And uh, God had another plan, so we're in February now, uh, but it's still the beginning of the year. Uh, but it's always good to take stock and to open up our hearts to the Lord and say, Lord, it's a new year. Is there anything that you want to speak to me about? Is there anything I need to make adjustments with? Anything at all that you want to redirect my life? We should always be looking for that all year round, not just in the beginning of the year. But the beginning of the year is a great time to do it because we're already kind of thinking about are this new year coming, and we're already kind of in that mode. I don't know if you do New Year's resolutions. I have, a, I have this repeating New Year's resolution to not have any, uh, and uh, I always break it by having that one resolution. So the circular reasoning uh, I have to get free from. But resolutions have, can be good. You know, mostly they usually don't last very long, and we can know that because the population in all the gyms across America inflate for about a month, and then they go back to their normal uh, time uh, or normal population because we have great intentions, but we don't always um, follow through and we don't always have the power to follow through or, or the, the, the character or whatever you want to ascribe it to, to keep going. I have found that small changes usually translate into long-term changes and big changes usually translate into short-term changes. Why? Because we can only handle so much change at once, usually. And, and so that can be true also in our Christian walk. When we try to do too much too fast, change everything, you know, I'm going to go from, you know, five-minute devotions to four hours, you know. I mean, that can happen. We can do that, and we can stick to that. I mean, we, there's anything's possible with God, but, uh, you know, that doesn't always happen. Um, so I would just encourage you to, to think about a handful of things or a few things that the Lord may be open to you changing and maybe he might direct you towards, um, but he always wants us to keep growing. He hasn't given us the luxury, and I'm doing air quotes for those that you are just listening to this, um, of deciding for ourselves how mature we will be. It's easy for us to assume that God leaves that in our court. I'll just let you decide how mature you want to be. You can be as mature as you want to be, but I'm going to leave it up to you. But the problem is, we've been bought, with well, that's not really a problem, it's a, it's a huge privilege, that we've been all been bought, those of us that know Christ, we've all been bought with a price. We've been purchased off the slave block, the slave being to, to sin, a slave to sin. He's purchased us with his own blood. He owns us. And he told us, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, Every other week? No. Every week? No. Daily. Take up our cross daily 
and follow me, which means that the people that I'm going to be talking to, I don't know who I'm going to be talking to that day. I don't know what he's going to leave me to do on any given day because I'm taking up my cross and dying to myself. I'm dying to my own plans, my own agenda. This is what's supposed to be happening, that I'm dying to my own plans and my own will, and I'm surrendering to, to whatever he has for me that day, to speak to whomever he has me to speak to that day. So I don't know what's going to happen, which means that he may lead me to read even more scripture. He may read, lead me to have a, a longer time of worship or a longer time of prayer. He may lead me to share my faith with 15 people that day, but maybe I haven't shared with one person for the last six months, or he hasn't led me to, you know, whatever it is, and now he's leading me to do all these things. So because I'm dying to self every day, it means that now he gets to determine how much I grow. And we get in this weird thing in our minds like, I can, be, I can grow as much or as little as I want to because he's just left it up to me. Yes, the potential's there. I can grow as much as I want, but he's not going to lead me to, to go deeper and deeper all the time, is he? Yes. I know I've found that ever since day one when I was 20, when I received Christ. Is that, how many 20-year-olds like, completely give their lives to Christ and turn their back on the world, burn every bridge, and never backslide? Not being perfect, but never have a season of backsliding. That's been my portion. And because of that, he brought me places and brought me into a level of maturity I never dreamed, areas of ministry I never dreamed. But it wasn't because I had some great vision and some great plan and great aspirations. It was because I just aimed to surrender every day. Of course, didn't always do that, but aimed to do that every day as a general thing in my life. And because he led me day by day, step by step, it ended up being where I'm at today. And, and so he wants all of that for every one of us. And so he says we're, he, we have to surrender to what he wants and what he envisions for our life, what he, who he wants us to be. And I believe that's true for all of us collectively as Calvary Chapel Half Moon Bay. I believe that collectively he wants us to grow, collect, collectively wants us to be serving together because he's called, he tells us in his word that we're members of one another. I want to say that again. He's told us that we are members of one another. When one part of the body suffers, we all suffer. We're part of a larger whole. I've said this many times that I have to keep saying it, not just to myself, but to everyone else, to break through self-deception and this whole Western thought that we have that we're primarily, first off, an individual member of the body of Christ who secondarily are part of a larger whole. His word does not reveal that. His word reveals that we are primarily a body who secondarily are part of, um, in, we're individual members. It's the opposite of what we naturally believe. But because we're individually, individualized, not a word, but we're, we're, we've been trained to be individually minded, it's easy for us to infuse that into Scripture. But it's not in the Scriptures. Other countries that are more family-based, family-oriented, that are other parts of the world, they don't have any problem with that. They primarily see themselves as a larger whole in life who happen to be individual members. So when they see all these things that we see in Scripture, totally makes sense. So we have to always fight and fight and fight and militate against the idea that we're primarily individual members. So Jesus calls each of us to, to individually and collectively be led by Him and grow and be stretched and that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 16, when he says, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. When I was a new Christian, I thought the gates of Hades are coming at us and we got to defend ourselves against the gates of Hades because I just didn't understand what gates were. But in ancient, uh, even many parts of today, but especially back then, the gates around a city are the, the, the place where people attack and they had walls that protected them against the city. So the gates were defensive mechanisms. So what Jesus is talking about, he's not talking about the gates of hell will not win against us as they come at us and we're defending ourselves against the gates of Hades. He's saying the church is moving forward. The church is attacking. The church is moving forward and the gates of Hades, the protective mechanisms of Hades, the gates cannot withstand my church going forward. And why is that? Because he's building the church. If we're building the church, 
that we could never, ever, ever think about that the gates of Hades would be able to protect themselves against us. But he's building the church. That's why Jesus knows nothing of a defeatist attitude. He knows nothing of a defeatist, victimized, or victimization type outlook because he says all through Scripture that he's, we're the head, you know, that we're the ones that are moving forward, that, that, that our enemies can't even hold a candle to the power of, of the Lord that's in us, that's moving forward, that God is sovereign over everything. He works all things together for good, for those that love God and are called according to his purpose. That means even what people mean for evil, God's going to use for our good. And the abundant Christian life is the promised land, not heaven. All these old hymns talking about, you know, the promised land is heaven. Those aren't, it, the promised land is the abundant Christian life that's claimed through claiming the promises of God, because the promises of God are yes and amen. They're always yes. God isn't double-minded, and sometimes they're yes, sometimes they're no. In his word, he says they're always yes. And so we can stand on those things. And what does he say? We're more than conquerors. What does he say? There's nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. What does he say? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What does he say? That we're our, our co-heirs with Christ. That, that there's nothing that can withstand us going forward. And that's what he says when he says we, he's going to build his church because he's building our lives. He saves us. He calls us. He gifts us. He gives us the power and grace to keep growing and moving forward. And he's the head of the church. And because he is the head of the church, there's nothing that can stop him from developing us and helping us move forward in our walk with him and growing and all of that. But it, but, it, but it depends on us doing things his way. You know, Burger King has this theme, have it your way. You know, and I remember that growing up going, ever, the adults ever told me I can't have it my way. And these people are saying I can have it my way. I love Burger King. I'm, 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 I'm automatically for Burger King because they're telling me I can have it my way. And that's what the sinful nature is, is wanting to have it its way. But the key to fruitful Christian life is to die to self and die to that sinful nature and say yes to God and say no to our flesh. And our flesh hates its death that happens every single day. That's why our flesh doesn't want us to take up our cross daily and follow him. And that's why churches are filled with people that are willing to listen to preachers that are all about getting, helping them get what they want. They want, they want to hear that. They want to, you know, they want to heap up for themselves teachers that will give them what their itching ears want to hear. And it's always man-centered. It's always about you. It's always getting about you getting what you want. The subject will all in a in a, a type of church like this, the subject will always be you. Getting what you want. Success principles wrapped up in Christian garb. And and it that will get the crowds, that will get the budget. But the ones that are faithful to talk about what Jesus talked about, to take up our cross daily and follow, those aren't going to be as the bigger churches usually because the flesh hates that. The flesh doesn't want to hear that. The flesh wants to hear success principles. It wants to hear the things that are, that are like exciting and titillating to our sinful nature. We can have anything that we want at any time. And anything that gets in the way of that is not something that, that, that we should be engaged in. But Jesus says, I want to get in the way of what your sinful nature wants. I want to get in the way. I haven't called you to, to be about expressing everything that you want. I've called you to die to self. So today, I want to look at, today and next week, I want to look at Jesus' template for the church. Did you know there's a template for the church? There's an exact way that God has revealed for the, that the church is supposed to be, and he hasn't let, let it be up to preachers and pastors to decide what the church is to be about. He's, it has a very narrow focus on what the, what the church should be about. And the things that he does say it should be about can take up as much time as we all have and then some in terms of the expression of those principles. So I want to look at that template. There is a template because there's the seeker model, there's the signs and wonders model, there's the, there's the I mean, I could go on and on and on, all the different models that are out there. That, that people are make church, to, you know, like I said, the self-help model. There's all these different models out there that aren't what I believe is biblical in terms of what the church should be about. So we need to look at what God says so we can see it for ourselves and we can see how we can be potentially a part of what he's doing as we yield to him. So 
God has set things up a certain way. And he set it up a certain way. And those are the, the, when the church is what it's supposed to be, that's the church that God could add to. Really important. We want to grow. It's not our business in terms of growing numerically. We know that happens if we're fruitful, if we're obeying the Lord, if we're building the church up. Jesus will add to the church. But it's still Jesus who's adding to the church. People getting saved, people coming out of unhealthy environments, that God moves to healthy environments. Um, all those things are from God. So we want to become a church that God can add to. That's why the title of my message this morning is The Church God Can Add To Part 1. And we're going to look at seven things this week and next that the early church valued and participated in and were led by God to do as the Holy Spirit led them and and they were yielded to Him. And these are the principles. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, evangelism, the Word of God, fellowship, breaking of bread, prayers, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And it's not by accident that we see all these things in the first couple chapters leading up to verse 47, where we're told this, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Verse 47 comes after the first 46 verses of chapter 2 and all of chapter 1. And there's a lot of things in those chapters that God puts a stamp of approval on by revealing, by leading Luke to write verse 47, and that, that and the Lord added to the church daily. Basically, he's saying, everything that you've seen up to this point, I'm blessing and adding to the church. And don't we want to be a church that God adds to? When you, we don't want to be leading people to the, have, you know, trying to have God preach the gospel through us and, and save people through us and, and only for us to not make disciples. Because he doesn't say go into all the world and make disciples. He says, I mean, make converts. He says, go into all the world and make disciples. And that requires us to preach the gospel. But he's not going to do that and bring people into our midst to receive Christ or bring people in that need discipling if we're not being the church that God, growing, and not going to be perfect, of course, but if we're not increasingly becoming the church that God could add to. So how are disciples made? Let's just answer that question first. So we need to look at Ephesians chapter 4. And actually, it's the first sermon that I taught here when I was trying out or, you know, uh, whatsoever the word is, you know, where you're, where, you're, where you're auditioning or whatever. It was the first message because it's so close to my heart in terms of foundational principles related to the Christian life, what the church is supposed to be about. Ephesians chapter 4, excuse me, verses 11 through 16. I want to read it to you. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. I want to pause there for a second. The word equipping there in verse 12, that means to put in your intended condition. So they would use that word to describe when they would clean fish, um, when they would mend their nets, not clean fish, excuse me, mending their nets. And they would also use this word, not in scripture, but they would use it outside of scripture to communicate when a doctor would set a bone. They would set a bone. So they would be putting, and it's the word from which we get our word, cateri, 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 uh, what's the word when you cateraize something? That's the word. It starts with kata. Um, and it, it means, the common denominator is that you put something in its intended condition or you repair it. So that's what it means in verse 12. For the equipping, the leaders that God calls are called to put God's people through the means that he has set up in their intended condition in terms of maturity. Then in verse 13, it's, it's, it continues with the rest, of every, the rest of how it works of making disciples. Verse 13 says, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. So he doesn't want immaturity. Do you see that? In that verse, God is clearly saying we should no longer be children. He doesn't want an immaturity in any of his people. That's what being a disciple means. It means you become mature. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine. The first thing we're going to look at in our, not the first thing, but the first few things we're going to look at is God's word. By the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of a deceitful plotting, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, that's literally truthing in love, may grow up in all things uh, into him who is the head Christ. Notice the word grow there in verse 15. May grow up. 
God's desire is that all of us grow up spiritually. The writer of the book of Hebrews says, I wish we could go on to all these other teachings, but you are still on the milk of the word, and we still have to go over the elementary truths because you haven't grown. You should be teachers by now, but you're not. He's telling that to the entire church that he's writing to, that they should be further along, they should be teachers by now, but they have to be on milk. He doesn't want that for any of us. He wants us to grow. Verse 16, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share, causes growth, is our word again, growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Notice in verse 16 that there are two times the word every appears. It says, and knit together by what every joint supplies, and then he says, according to the effect of working by which every part does its share. If, you don't, if you're not part of every, can you raise your hand? Everyone, it's, it means everybody. So is there anybody, well, you know, I don't feel led to be serving. Is that something you can legitimately say based on scripture here? No, every part does its share. And he describes this anatomical, he uses anatomical language in Greek. You don't see it on the surface here in English, but in Greek, it's, that's why they're trying so hard to say it with joined and knit together. That's all anatomical language that would, they would use to describe a body, interdependent. And that's what Paul talks about in Romans chapter 12 and other places where he talks about the body is interdependent. When one part suffers, the rest suffers. It's a beautiful analogy there. So how are disciples made according to this? There's two pillars. You have the leaders equipping the saints for the work of ministry, and you have the other pillar, which is every part doing its share, using its spiritual gifts to build up the body. That's what it's saying. That's why I know that these gifts never stop because we never stop as the body of Christ needing to be built up and brought into maturity and brought into to growth. And, and so we have to understand this is how God set it up. This is, this is how the church is supposed to function. This is how disciples are to be made, is by the leadership equipping and the rest of the body using their gifts. And in reality, it's everybody using their gifts because the leaders using their gift, the leaders are using their gifts in equipping the saints for the work of ministry. So it's just everybody using their gifts. And that's how disciples are made. You have to understand that to understand how the church is supposed to function. So um, I want to move on here to, to other principles connected to these things. But God's not going, like I said, not going to just bring a bunch of people in to be saved and, or, or introduce us to a lot of people and give us opportunities to preach the gospel if we're not willing to preach the gospel and we're not willing to be other-centered or we're not willing to grow. And, and so he's called leaders, like myself, to direct in the appropriate way to keep us on the right track. And not a lot of leaders these days are willing to tell their congregations hard truths because, unfortunately, they are counting every seed and like every single person there, they don't want to offend people so people will stop coming or stop giving or whatever it is because their faith is not in God to build the church. They're, they feel like it's their responsibility to grow the church. I get so much junk mail with all these great seminars and all these things I can take advantage of to help me learn how to grow my church. And I just want to you write back, not my church. Number two, it's not my job to grow the church. It's Jesus. Jesus said he would build it. And then just put it up in a little envelope, send it off in the snail mail, and just, I don't know what they would do if they got a, a letter back from a, from a pastor saying that, but that's been pounded in us in Calvary Chapel from the very beginning. Because Chuck tried all these, these, these tactics and things. The denomination he was in was trying everything. And then when he, all of a sudden he started feeding, actually feeding the sheep, he, and then he realized healthy sheep beget sheep. Wow, imagine that. And he started feeding the sheep instead of beating the sheep, as he would say. They started multiplying. And he had, came up with this term, healthy sheep beget sheep. And so he's like, I'm not going to starve them anymore. And then it started exploding. The church doubled in like four months. And, and they're asking him, what is the secret? What are you doing differently? We need to know the secret. And he's like, I'm just feeding him the word of God. I'm teaching verse by verse. That's not the answer we wanted. Well, what is the secret? We want to know a, a gimmick or something that we can do. And, and then they just transferred him to another church that was struggling, and that started growing. He's like, you're doing something because, look, it's working. And he's like, God's doing it, not me. 
So he ended up leaving that, that, that denomination after pounding his head against the wall for 17 years, trying every tactic that they wanted him to do. And then, and then he came to Calvary Chapel, and God just did a sovereign work of the Spirit because he wasn't going to try to take the credit. He knew it wasn't him. He'd already got to the end of himself. His 17 years is a picture of a lot of pastors, when God's truly calling somebody, their preparation time, you know, of this long time of frustration and getting to the end of themselves and realizing like they're not, God doesn't need you. That's why all the hardship happens. I mean, I've spent 12 years. Between the time God called me when I was 21 to the time I started being a pastor in 2003, 12 years of character development. It wasn't books and it wasn't all this stuff. It was character development. God showing me, see, this is what, this is what you can do by yourself. I want to show you what I can do through you if you just yield and you wouldn't be so impressed with you. Over and over again, learning that lesson until finally after 12 years, I'm like, uncle, I give up. It's either you or it's not going to happen. And, and that's what happens. That's what he has to do in a truly called person to lead the church so that when he does a work, he's not lifted up in pride, doesn't think it's for him, and doesn't have to be up here to meet some need in their life. I don't have to be the person up here. I don't. I really don't. I could be, it could be anybody up here. But God's called me to be up here, and I want to be obedient to what he's called me to do. But it's not like I get some great reward as much as I'm thankful for how he uses me by being up here. I have never needed to be the person up front. And, and, um, but I'm thankful that he's, he's worked it out how he has because it's been a blessing to people. So, but it's hard for pastors to tell people what they really need to hear because sometimes they're afraid of the reaction. But Paul told Timothy at the end of, Tim, at the end of Paul's life, the last letter that Paul wrote, he wrote, to, he wrote to Timothy, who was timid, who was fearful, and he told him this in 2 Timothy 4, verses 2 through 4. He said, preach the word. Now, I want to just stop with that. I could do a whole sermon just on that. He didn't say preach from the word. He didn't, preach a, he didn't say preach about the word. He didn't say read some verses, launch it, and never come back to them ever again. He said preach the word word itself. That's so important. There's nothing more important than God's word. What could I possibly say up here that would be more important or more transformative than God's eternal word? Nothing. When, I'm, when we're reading the verses, when we, when we, when we uh, you know, begin and we're all reading the verses first, I can already tell things are happening in the room just by the power of God's word itself starting to go out and penetrate people's hearts. I can tell many times in the room. I can tell there's stuff happening. It's powerful. So we read it once and we read it again when we go through it and then I expound on it. There's nowhere to hide. There's no wiggle room. Like the Holy Spirit's going to get you, you know, because he's going to honor his word. So Paul wrote to Timothy and said, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince my pastor supposed to convince? Yeah. Rebuke? Is my pastor supposed to rebuke me? Yes. Exhort? Is my pastor supposed to exhort me? Yes. With all long suffering and teaching, meaning that it's going to cost you, Timothy. It's going to cost you to have to say these things. For a time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires. What would their own desires be about? What they get out of it? Prosperity principles. Because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves teachers. So they're the ones that bring the teachers. They're the ones that call the, these, these men that teach them what they want to hear, not God. It's clear from the verse. It's God that's not calling them. It's people calling them. Verse 4, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to fables. So I've been called by God to convince, rebuke, and exhort, even if I pay a price for it, and I will do it by God's grace. I don't have a choice. I've said before, you know, I was a big fan of Wonder Woman growing up. And uh, I mean, Linda Carter was, uh, you know, she, she was something, you know, when I was really little. And uh, I'm like, Wonder Woman, she is wonderful. wonderful. And, um, but the one thing I remember is when she would put that lasso around people and they'd have to tell the truth. And I was so afraid that someday someone would have that and, I would, and they would put that around me, and I would have to tell the truth uh, as, a, as a boy because I told some, some whoppers because, you know, I, I had it my way. Remember? It was about Burger King. So, so I was like, you know, 
So I've, I have said before, I feel like I have that lasso around me up here. I feel like I have to tell you the truth. I have to. Whether it, I don't care if it offends you. I don't, I don't want to have your pushback or your, I don't agree with that, or write me a letter or whatever it is, all the different ways people express that. But I don't really don't care because I'm going to have to stand before God. I'm going to have to stand before him and give an account. And teachers will endure stricter judgment, James tells us. And so I, I want to be found faithful and tell you the truth. That means that you're not always going to want to hear it. I'm going to keep telling you about our prayer meeting on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., whether you want to hear it or not, because it's so important and so powerful, and so it will make such a difference in our church if we're more engaged with corporate prayer or whatever else, sharing your faith or giving or, or whatever it is, loving one another when you don't want to love. I mean, I have to tell you the truth, and it's a privilege to do that, but there is a price to pay, but it's just people aren't willing to do that as much these days. That's sad. So I want to get with these characteristics regarding the template that he's laid out. And the first one is the baptism with the Holy Spirit. I want to read from Acts chapter 1, beginning in verse 6. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus is speaking here of the baptism with the Holy Spirit. As I said, um, you know, we talked about how in our study, when we've looked at John, we've said things are coming in chapters 14 through 16 regarding Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit. I've said that before, it's coming, and it is, and we'll get into that more in depth when we, when we get there. But he tells them, that the purpose of it, in verse 8, the purpose of it is to have power. Power to be a witness to something or someone. Power to be a witness to Jesus. And he gave them that power when he baptized them with the Holy Spirit. But later they're going to pray when they're threatened, and they're going to pray again, and they're refilled with the Holy Spirit. We're leaky vessels. So we have to be refilled. That's completely biblical. Maybe you've never heard before that God's called us to be refilled with the Holy Spirit. It's all through the book of Acts. They're refilled because we are leaky vessels and we need God to refill us to have boldness. And it was true then and it was true today. So they had all this education. They're with Jesus for three years, at least three years. And they had ministry experience. They were sent out. God, Jesus gave them power to do all these miracles and cast out demons and all these things. They had ministry experience and education. We would look at that and go, they're ready to go. They're good to go. Jesus said, no, don't move. Don't move an inch. Do not leave here. Stay here and wait till the promise of the Father that I've given because you need to receive power. And they were all focused on, you know, is this the time you're going to restore the kingdom of Israel and whether or not he's going to be a political Messiah? They're still focusing on that. That was, wasn't his purpose of coming. And so they needed that power. Even though they had that experience, they had to learn so many things from Jesus. Obviously, everything that someone would need to know, they learned, but there was something that they needed. They needed power. Because Jesus is going to tell them in John chapter 14 and 15, he's going to say, tell them that, that it is to your advantage that I go away. Because if I don't go away, I will not send the helper. And he says, I will send you another counselor. The word another means uh, another of the same kind. When we use the word another, we, it doesn't tell us whether or not it's another of the same kind or a different kind. But in Greek, they have a whole other word for something that's another of the same kind and another of a different kind. And there he uses the word that communicates another of the same kind. Just like me. And, and the counselor means someone that comes alongside, the paraclete. That's the word. And so he says, you're not going to be at a loss because I'm gone. Actually, it's to your advantage because now I won't be limited by locality. I'll be able to go with each one of you wherever you go. It's to your advantage. It was better. They would never put that word in their minds related to Jesus leaving. It would be, that would, it would be better for them ministry-wise, but it was. They needed power. They needed boldness. And that's exactly what you see them express from on the day of Pentecost and afterwards. They were filled with boldness. They were filled with power. They, were, they, were, they would, did not um, back down to any threats. 
they, they, would, they would call to God and ask for power and strength to be rebaptized and refilled with the Holy Spirit. They recognized their need, but they would, they would go to God and meet the challenge because he would fill them with the Holy Spirit. So much of the church today, and I say this without any pride, and I, there's plenty of times when I'm without power, but so much of the church today is powerless, timid, afraid, and defeated. And that, and that, that is, should, ne, should not be. He's given us everything that pertained to life and godliness. He's given us everything that he need, we need to be bold for him and not be ashamed no matter what anyone says. We are in the largest unchurched area in America. The Bay Area is the largest unchurched area in America. We have a great opportunity. It's not like, oh, woe is us. We're, we're just a few among few and we're completely helpless and in an area we're outnumbered, we're out-resourced. We have Google, we have Facebook, we have all these social media giants here with all their funding and all the political power is against us and all this. And Jesus says, oh, so it kind of sounds like Rome, but better. Rome was way worse. And Jesus reveals in his word that he turned the, through the early church, he turned the world upside down through the early church. And really it's right side up. But there was no limitations on how he could use them because of his Holy Spirit. See, he purposely came during that time without the church marketing, without the, the, the business model, without all these crafty things, these worldly tactics in there. All they had was the Holy Spirit to show everybody, all, even into our day today, that you don't need anything more than the Holy Spirit. You, you, you don't need anything else. You, you're not at a disadvantage you know there's more Christians in China than there is here? Way more. And the gospel's spreading way faster. The gospel's spreading way faster right now in Iran than it is in America. South America is exploding. Africa is exploding. The whole world, even China, the whole world except Europe and America is exploding. I talked to some missionaries when I was at the pastor's conference that, oversee, that are overseeing the, you know, the, whole, the Calvary Chapel movement down in Mexico. They can't find pastors fast enough for the hunger that's there. People are wanting the gospel. They are wanting the truth. And, and, and so, but we think it's the whole world is just like how we experience here in Europe and everything, but the whole rest of the world's exploding in terms of the gospel. So we can look at these, these 120 who are in the upper room, and we can see a difference in their lives after they're filled with the Spirit. It wasn't just the disciples they were filled with the Spirit. It was all 120 that were in that upper room, including Mary. Mary didn't ascend with Jesus. I'm sorry to break it to you. She was in the upper room. Um, so we, we, we can't let tradition you know, um, affect how we see things. So everything was changed once they had this power. The second characteristic of God's template of the church is evangelism. After or on the day of Pentecost, on uh, or after the upper room and everything where God poured out his Holy Spirit, baptized them, and they all spoke in other tongues, there was a sound that everybody heard in the city, a loud sound that, that, that occurred. And they all came. They were all there for the Feast of Pentecost, and they all came to, like, what is this? And then they saw the disciples there, and they were praising and magnifying God in, in a language other than what they knew. So to them, it was unknown tongues. But to the people that were hearing it, it was their own tongue. And they thought, what is this? What does this mean? Or, you know, that we're hearing, they're hearing them praise God in our own language. And, and that was a sign to them. And that's a whole other study that you can do regarding the, 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 why he did that. But the whole point of it is, is that they were there. And God took advantage of that and had Peter stand up and says, what you're experiencing now is biblical. The prophet Joel spoke and said, your sons and daughters will prophesy in the last days. Your young men will dream dreams. I mean, your old men, I mean, young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams, you know, and this is the beginning of the last days, basically. And he's saying, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, all flesh. And he's, and then he, he talked about their guilt in delivering over the Messiah to be crucified. And they, they were cut to the heart and they asked, what should we do? And he t told them to repent, and he, and he preached the gospel, and, and around 3,000 people got saved. Jesus had already told them in Matthew 28 to go and preach the God, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And, and he gave them the great commission. As it's been said, it's a, it's a commandment. It's not a suggestion. It's not the great suggestion. 
It's the Great Commission. And that's our mission. That's our mission. That's all of our energy should be focused on. Is In other words, why, did, why does God want us to be made into disciples? He wants us to be made into disciples to glorify God, of course, but, but on a practical level to be able to preach the gospel and win the world to Christ. That's our mission. Everything else, all should contribute to that. Should have Everything should be focused on the gospel being preached. There are great causes out there. But if everybody received the gospel, then all these secondary causes are, that, that people are into or want to spend money and time with would be taken care of. Because when the Holy Spirit comes inside of a life, it changes them and transforms them. And all of a sudden, the, these causes or whatever that we're passionate about, which are worthy causes, all of a sudden, it's not something that we have to work in, in their hearts to change because God changes their hearts. So everything should be about preaching the gospel, the Great Commission. And so all of us, God's called us to preach that gospel, to be willing to open up our mouths. You know, I know the saying is popular, you know, we should preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. You know, that's good. I re- actually, I really do like that. But that sometimes is used inadvertently for people to never open their mouth. Now they just want to live, live, God, live, live out their relationship with God as a lifestyle and they never actually open their mouth. To preach the gospel. But see, that kind of life, that different kind of life, that's the salt that causes the thirst for people to ask the question, why is your life different? What's different about you? Well, let me share. And Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's applied all the time to Bible study. And it's true. It's, it's not, you know, it's not where you can't use that. But the main context of that verse that Paul shares is the gospel. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, meaning hearing the gospel brings forth faith. When you preach the gospel to somebody, that produces faith. And if they're ready, they will make that decision. So he's called us to to be a part of what he's doing and be faithful to preach the gospel. And, And so we have to understand that God's called us to see people be saved. A new believer should be around us all the time. If we're not seeing new believers around us, that is screaming to us that something's wrong related to our, be, our willingness to preach the gospel. When I was in school, in ministry, pastoral ministry school at, uh, with Pastor Chuck in Costa Mesa, we studied what uh, dying and dead churches look like, what their characteristics are, and I want to read them to you. Little, little or no concern for the lost, inward focus versus outward focus, Value tradition to the neglect of trying new things initiated by the Spirit. No concern for reaching the younger generation. Little or no outreach. Little or no corporate prayer. Little or no concern for Jesus' return. Speak of glory days of times past versus what God is doing now. That, that, That should be really convicting for us. Do we see that? How, how How do we score as a church? How do we score? I would say we don't score really well. And, and, and so that should be convicting. Again, it's individual, but it's also corporate as, as well. So the first, sometimes the first step in getting better is getting out of denial and realizing there's a problem. And, 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 and we, God wants us to be a, 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 an alive church full of life, to have extreme concern for the lost, to be outward instead of having an inward focus, to value what the Holy Spirit is initiating by the Holy Spirit in our lives, and also having concern for reaching the younger generation, to having lots of outreach, lots of corporate prayer, concern for Jesus' return, who's not going to be snatched up in the rapture um, with, with him, with us, and, and not speaking and focusing on the glory days, but focusing on what God wants to do now. What's he want to do in the future? And I'm just speaking all of this into the room and into our hearts because he wants us to understand that it's not just going to happen. What we want for the church here, it's not just going to happen if we, if we don't change and if, we don't, if we're not growing in our walk with him, if we're not growing and being uncomfortable as we're stepping out in new areas of ministry if we're not willing to be a part of corporate prayer, if we're not willing to open our mouths when we're at, when we're at, the, when we're at Chevron, you know, and we're putting gas in our car and thinking about how much we shouldn't be paying, like we're pay, overpaying for gas, 
And then I start looking around and see this person that's there that's pumping their gas. And God says, I want you to go and give them a track or give them, give them a, ask to offer prayer for them. Do you need prayer? I feel like God's put you on my heart for prayers or anything I could pray for you about. Or just start a conversation with them or give them a church invitation card, which we're going to, be ha- we're going to have here soon. We'll be able just to give them information about our church or whatever it is, just to get our focus off of ourselves. Even though we're not comfortable with it, even though we're not used to it, God, to, to be the, new per- the person that God's making us to be. He doesn't want a dead church. I don't want to pastor a dead church. I'm not saying we're dead. I'm not, I'm not saying we're dead at all. Please understand. But we're, we're, we're on that road if we don't change in terms of going that direction. And so that's what, that's what God's pressed upon my heart. The third and last characteristic we'll cover today, I know it's getting a little bit late, but you haven't had me for like a month, so you should be able to uh, <laughs> endure. So look at verse 42 in our passage. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. So the apostles' doctrine, we'll just want to cover that real quick. You have to have an emphasis on God's word in your personal life. You have to have devotions every day. It's non-negotiable. How many of you have devotions every day? Okay, that's brave of you. And, and that's good. So how, when's the last time you asked God if your devotions look like what he wants it to look like in your life? When's the last time you asked is this how you want me to have devotions? Is this how long you want me to have devotions? Do you want me to study something else? Do you want me to study something in addition to what I'm studying? And, and by the way, devotions are great and they have their place in terms of like books, but have a time of just in your Bible, just you and him, in, your, in his word directly. Just watch what God will do if you do that. And again, they have their place, but I just feel like it's, it, you should have at least some time directly in God's word. So he says um, that these disciples in, in, Matt, in John 14, verse 26, he told them that he's going to bring back to the remembrance all these things. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. So that's, that's how we know that they are, wrote down the things that they did, that are, those are correct because he promised that he would. Jesus validated the Old Testament, and he promised the New Testament. So the whole thing is God's word. And Jesus said, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. If you only ate once a week physical food, you wouldn't expect to be healthy. I was doing alternate day fasting. I tried it. No, it wasn't one day a week, but it felt like it. Um, but, But if you would never expect to be healthy if you only ate once a week, so if we're only eating once a week and only having, you know, reading God's word once a week at church, we're not going to be healthy. Jesus said, if you continue in my word, you're my disciples indeed. Those are the ones that are his disciples, the ones that continue in his word. So he calls us to systematically study his word and to go through it and learn. And that's why I love Thursday nights, going through the book of Exodus verse by verse with Pastor Chuck and then coming and discussing it. That group is growing because people have a hunger for God's word. We're about to get into Leviticus. I bet you you've never gone to a church Bible study in Leviticus. In fact, I could guarantee it unless you've gone to a Calvary Chapel. In fact, sadly, most churches, pastors will make jokes. Don't worry, we won't be in Leviticus. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Do you realize how much Leviticus says about what Jesus did for us and his offering and how inapproachable God is apart from coming God's way and all the amazing offering. Leviticus is amazing. Remember, it says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, all scripture, even Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy and everything that people pass over, all the minor prophets, Obadiah. When's the last time you read Obadiah? I mean, that's all of, that's part of God's word. That's just as inspired as Matthew. If you understand the doctrine of inspiration, you understand that the Holy Spirit inspired his writers just as much as he inspired the Messiah to say what he said. So it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing that God has, has laid out. So we can leave our first love and not even realize it. Jesus said this to the church of Ephesus. Nevertheless, I have, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you 
repent. He says, remember from where you have fallen. It was, a, it was a higher place that they were spiritually before. Remember what that looked like. Do the, former, do the first works that you did. Go back and do the, the basics. And that's what sometimes we need to do when we've drifted. You know, Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 says, Therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So, we can drift away without even realizing it, and we can neglect our salvation because we stopped doing the things we did in the beginning when we were new believers. When we were new believers, we were just devouring God's Word. We were spending lots of time in God's Word, praying and, and, and sharing our faith potentially, and going to church, not going through every study, everything that was available, we were going to and being a part of, and we grew like crazy. Jesus is saying, if you've drifted, and only you know between you and Him if you've drifted, if you've drifted, go back and do the former things. Go back and do the things that you did in the beginning that caused you to just grow like crazy because he is our first love. It doesn't say that, that we lost our first love there. It says we left it. It's not something we lose, like, gone. Where'd it go? Where'd my first love go? It's elusive. I don't have it anymore. It's no, we leave it by neglecting our salvation and neglecting the things that he's called us to do. I feel like that that's all enough for the Holy Spirit to use for us. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that you've so clearly spoken to your church, Lord. Thank you. Thank you that you care enough about us to speak to us and change us. And we love you for it. And we want to be what you've called us to be. We want to fulfill our ministry by your grace and by your power. Make Calvary Chapel Half Moon Bay into what you want it to be, Lord. It's your church. You're the head. Help us just to be in line with what you're doing. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.